I feel like when I lead the singing, I need to thank the accompanist for keeping me on track, as uh, Irma does very, very well. Thank you. Before we listen to the Bible and seek to preach the Word of God, the preacher needs prayer, as do the hearers of the word of the Lord. So let us pray and beseech God's mercy as we try to hear his word. Heavenly Father, we are Christians and we want to live our lives in manifestation of that reality. We have come to this place set aside for worship, worship of the living and true God, the Redeemer. We have come to be fed the word. We pray that you would edify our souls this day by granting us a measure of grace by the power of the Holy Spirit in his presence among us, that we might better understand your word and better love your word and seek to better obey your word. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. I invite you to open your Bibles to 2 Thessalonians as we begin a journey through this marvelous epistle. I need to tell you, or I feel like I want to remind us that um, I mentioned this, I think, back when I started 1 Thessalonians, that which was now quite a while ago, um, that the reason I felt so inclined uh, to move in this direction right now is because, uh, to some degree, of the context in which we're living in this country. And I want you to know that. That's in the back of my mind. Uh, Where we are, what's going on here, uh, what may be going on in the future. I think it's important that God's people understand human history in the context of God's sovereignty and providential will. Um, nothing in history is out of sync with where God is going. That doesn't mean that sin uh, is right or that God approves sin or all the horrible things that take place in life. But what it means is that those things, sin and, and hatred and anger and rejection of people, that doesn't change God's plan. That doesn't get God off track. I think that's really important. Because we can have a holy hand-wringing over the problems that we're facing. And I don't want to do that. I don't want to just wring my hands and say, what are we going to do? What are we going to do? I, I want to look to the gospel. I want to look to the word. I want to look to God. I want you to do that too. So if you don't want to do that, you're free not to come. Because that's what we're going to do when we come. Um, so as we march through, it's a short book, three chapters. It's going to, I think I have about 27 sermons out of this uh, three-chapter book. And it may get longer than that. I just, I always give myself the freedom to pause and refresh, you know. And uh, so we're not going to preach every verse, but every, what I would consider the high points of, of the book. Second Thessalonians uh, chapter 1, Paul begins with a very uh, Pauline uh, greeting. Uh, in verses 1 and 2, and that beloved uh, statement in verse 2, grace to you and peace from God the Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. And just simply to remind ourselves that this isn't just a, this isn't just a Pauline, um, I say this all the time, I write this all the time, so I'll just write it. No, I think Paul is intentional about this, and he is telling them that his heart for them is that they would come to know God's grace and peace in the Lord and the Lord Jesus Christ. Now I want to pick up with verse 3. And he talks about his prayer life. And he specifically talks about his prayer for them. 
And then it's followed by a commendation. And the commendation is clearly in view in this sermon today. Chapter 1, verse 3. We ought always to give thanks to God for you, brethren, as is always fitting. Could be translated proper or appropriate. He continues, because... So he's going to give a reason why he thanks God for them in prayer. Because, he writes, your faith is greatly enlarged. Now, let me just pause a minute and just get the picture. Uh, like a balloon, okay? Uh, a balloon can start out really, really small, but as you blow it up, and I've blown in lots of balloons in my children's birthday parties, and you, you'd be surprised how big those can get. And that's the idea. Their faith was enlarging. So he's giving thanks to God for their enlarged faith he continues and the love of each one of you toward one another grows ever greater same idea of enlargement growing uh, it's becoming bigger what is their love for each other who's the each other the each other is other Christians Okay, this is a church. He's writing to a Thessalonian church. And he is saying to them, I am so grateful because I'm watching you guys love on one another. And you're doing it better and better and better. It's growing. It's wonderful. The last time I checked, you were doing it. But you're doing it more now than you were then. Isn't that great? Hmm. He gave thanks to God for that. And then verse 4 Therefore, so because he saw their enlarged faith and growing love for each other, verse 3, verse 4, therefore, we ourselves, intensified subject, yes, Paul is actually saying, he's going to say this, we ourselves speak proudly of you among the churches of God for your perseverance and faith in the midst of all your persecutions and afflictions which you endure. They had the Apostle Paul seal of approval. And Paul bragged on them. He'd go to other churches. He'd say, have you seen what's happening in Thessalonica? That bunch is super. Wow. You ought to be like them. What is he bragging about in their lives? Their Enlarged faith, their growing love. And now in verse 4, their perseverance. Perseverance, what is that? It's endurance. It's, it's hanging in there when you feel like quitting. It's not giving up. It's not backing down. It's not apostatizing from the faith. I'm done with God. I'm done with church. I'm done with Bible. No, they are persevering. Oh, he said, I've watched you persevere in faith. Faith was a part of that perseverance. It fueled their, their, their uh, endurance or steadfastness. Their faith was alive to feed into that. In spite of the fact, verse 4, they were going through all kinds of persecutions and afflictions. They were enduring that. That wasn't just a momentary thing. They were going through that over a period of time. They were enduring that. They were steadfast and they persevered. So I want you to highlight in your mind, if not in your notes, the three qualities. I call them the three evidences of God's grace that Paul actually saw in their lives. That made him so excited about that church. And made him brag on that church to others. What are they? Again, in case you haven't caught on. Or you just woke up. An enlarged faith. A growing love for each other. And perseverance through faith. Through persecution and affliction. Those three evidences. Now there are. There are a couple of ideas there before I take each one of these virtues. But there are a couple of ideas I want to I call to your attention. 
And I'm, I hope to come back to it at the end of my sermon. One is that when a person is saved, you can tell it. Okay? It, it's, you can't hide your Christianity. Why? That's the second thing. Because God is working in you and on you when he saved you to make these things happen. This is not bragging on me. Oh, I have faith. Aren't you proud of me? No. I have love. Aren't you proud of me? No. I am so strong even when bad things happen. Aren't you, don't you brag on me? No. This is God in me. This is the Lord Jesus Christ living in me and the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit. God hasn't left me and I'm not leaving him because he hasn't left me. So, those three evidences are there in every Christian. In large faith, growing love, and hanging in there. And if they're not, the grace of God may not be present. Are you saved? I'll try to remember to say this at the end. I'll say it now to make sure I do. I don't care what you call yourself. You can call yourself a Baptist. But I want to ask you this question. Are you saved? You say, I just told you I was a Baptist. That and $5 will get you a cup of coffee at Starbucks. It means nothing. I mean, it means something. But eternally, it means nothing. Are you saved? Has Jesus Christ changed your life? Okay, now let's back up. Take each of these virtues. Faith. What does he mean by faith? A faith enlarged. Two things I think that he wants us to know about Faith. One is it's a gift. Faith is a gift. We are not born with faith. We are not born, well, in our sinful nature, we are not granted in our existence, our human existence, the capacity to exercise faith in Christ. When you exercised your faith in Christ, it wasn't because you figured it out, you were so smart, you were so good, you chose Jesus. That's not how this works. You did choose Jesus. You did exercise your will. You chose the Lord as your Savior. But it is only because God was already working on you. To actualize your will. To, to awaken you to the realities of Christ. The awfulness of, of sin. The beauties of the Lord Jesus Christ. The richness of His cross. And to give you an affectional, emotional desire to come to Christ and embrace Him as life itself. But make no mistake, that was God's gift to you. Ephesians 2.8 That not of yourselves, it is a gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. boast. Faith is a gift. The second thing that he wants you to know about faith is it grows. And I, I can't, I mean, he mentions this. Your faith is enlarged, thus it is, it is organic, it is dynamic, it is alive. It, it is not a thing. It, it is an energy, as it were. It's a liveliness within my heart. And I, I can't get over uh, the parable of Jesus, and it comes to mind for some reason, um, where Jesus talks about the kingdom of God starting out as a mustard seed. Remember that parable? And he's just tiny. And I've seen a mustard seed. Maybe you have. And, and don't drop it. You won't find it. It's just that small. But he said it grows. The kingdom grows to this very large plant that birds can nest in. Start small but grows large. And beloved, I think that's in view here because faith... Faith as a gift, when God saves us and calls us to himself and gives us the faith to believe in Christ, what is going on is he's implanting the kingdom inside of us. Yes, there is a sense in which the kingdom is not here yet. The, the kingdom is a very big thing. There's a categorical part of the kingdom in which the entire earth will one day come to Christ. Every knee will bow, every, every tongue will confess. That isn't happening yet. That part of the kingdom will happen when Jesus Christ comes. But if you are saved, you're part of the kingdom. That kingdom is within you, as Jesus would say, Look not around for the kingdom. The kingdom of God is within you. Thus, 
I think it's true to say he is helping us to understand by bragging on this faith in the Thessalonians that faith can and should grow. It should enlarge. First Peter, and I, I will just commend this text to you. I have, I have grown much to embrace it and love it. Talks a lot about faith and the engagement of life, particularly in times of trial. That, that faith is engaged with what's going on around us. First Peter 1.7 says that our faith is purified during times of trial. In that same verse, it says it's proven or demonstrated to be genuine and real in fiery testing. Uh, verse 5 of that same chapter says faith protects us in times of trial through the power of, of God. So faith can grow. It it grows to demonstrate the operation of the life of Christ in the presence of the Holy Spirit in a Christian's soul. A faith that grows shows that it's living, that it's real. And a faith that grows shows that there is an abiding in Christ, which fulfills Jesus' statement in John 15, that you must abide in me and my word abide in, in you. I want to I just say a final statement about that, about faith, and then we'll go to love. And that is this. This text and a lot of other texts about living, saving faith indicates that faith is not something you feel just in the moment when you pray to receive Christ, but faith is the platform upon which you build your life for the rest of your life because you've come to Christ. Thus, four times in the Scripture, Habakkuk 2.4 Romans 1.17, Galatians 3.11, and Hebrews 10.38, the Bible says the righteous or just will live by faith. So if you're saved, that saving faith is, is with you all through your life and engages every experience of life. The first evidence is faith. The second is love. Love. And there are two things that he says about their love. And verse 3, first, he says that they, their love, the love he's talking about here, is the love they have and they show to each other. I mentioned earlier when I read it, the each other is other Christians. Now, by the way, that implies that they, they have this understanding that they belong to each other, that they're connected to each other. Each other that that they are a family of faith they're a body of believers that have a covenant of agreement together that we stick together I've met people many people good people Christian people who did not believe in joining a church and my heart grieves every time because they're missing out on this I don't know why, whether it's I don't, I don't want to be accountable. I, don't, I, can, I want to come and go when I want. And I, I, you know, it's just, no, 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 no. To, to get the full maximum benefit of what it means to live for, in Christ on this earth means that when you're baptized by the Holy Spirit, you're baptized into the body of Christ. And every local body of believers should be reflective of the body of Christ. You're part of the invisible body of Christ, which means you should join a local body of Christ that's representative of that invisible body. There are a lot of reasons for that. I'll only mention one because it's in the text. You need to show love to Christians. And you need to be loved by Christians. Love is a two-way street, right? Sure it is. That's relationship. And here... Paul is saying, I am watching you Thessalonian Christians. You are a marvel to me. I'm amazed. I'm a little bit surprised, but I am absolutely delighted to watch you guys care for each other. You bring food to each other when you're sick and you, when someone gets in trouble and is arrested for being a believer, you help their family out and you, you circle around their kids and, and you, you help them out. Because you care about each other. You love them because they belong to Christ. You belong to Christ. Thus you belong to each other. They had love one for another. I have a lot more to say about that. But let me just pause there and say the second thing the text says about their love. Is just like he said about faith. 
he said their love was growing ever greater. So it's not a, a static, staid, concrete thing, but it's a pulsating, living thing. Love. Okay. All right. Now, there are two major points I want to make about loving each other in the church as he uh, states here uh, as an evidence of God's saving work. Number one, and it's a bit of a recapitulation of what I just said, but I'll probably say it again, is the absolute necessity of love in the Christian life for other Christians. The absolute necessity of love in the Christian life. What I mean by absolute necessity is this. One cannot be saved without coming to know the love of God for you in Christ. And if you come to know the love of God for you in Christ, you will also receive the love of God through your new birth and by God's powerful grace, you will come to have a change in your affections so that you love God and everything associated with God, especially the people of God. Because I love, you, you can't be saved and not love God. If, oh beloved, hear me. You may just be a friend. You may not be a brother or sister in Christ. You just may be a friend. I'm glad you're here. I'm glad you're seeing this. But if you don't love God, you're not saved. Do you love God? What's the demonstration of your love for God? How do you demonstrate and show and manifest your love for God? You're telling me God saved you and you don't love God. You don't love church. You don't go to church. You don't care. You don't read the Bible. You don't care. You don't pray. You don't care. You don't love being around God's people. You don't care. On what planet do you believe you're saved and live like that? So the point is to, to be saved means you come to know the love of God for you and you fall in love with God because he loves you and sent his son for you. And if you love God, you will fall in love with his people. Thus the two greatest commandments. Love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength and your neighbor as yourself. Loving people is not optional in the Christian life. We are commanded to love people. Galatians 5, 6 states the only thing that counts is faith expressing itself through love. <laughs> Jesus tells parables about love. The Good Samaritan is a good example of that. He talks in John 13 as he's preparing the disciples for his departure. He says, love one another as I have loved you. That's a big thing Jesus makes uh, to them. Colossians 3 verses 12 through 14. The apostle Paul writes the following. And we're going to talk about this text tonight. So as those who have been chosen by God, holy and beloved, put on the heart of compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, patience, bearing with one another and forgiving one another. Whoever has a complaint against anyone, just as the Lord forgave you, so also should you. And beyond all these things, he writes, put on love, which is the perfect bond of of unity. I am so tired of hearing everybody talk about diversity today. Will somebody please talk about unity? What binds us together in our diversity? For Christians, it is this. We love Jesus Christ with all of our hearts. And we love each other because together we belong to him. In all of our lives. I want to summarize what I'm saying here in a number of ways. You cannot be saved without knowing God's love for you. I've stated that at least two times. And if you're saved and knowing God's love for you. You will love God and God's others in your life. And if you do love God you can't help but show it. And if you do love others you can't help but show it. To fail to show love means you don't love So, thus, the absolute necessity of love in the Christian experience, the other aspect of that is what I will choose to call the dynamic reality of love. Just like faith, he indicates here 
about love in verse 3, that it was growing. It was growing. How was it growing? I think there's an implied sense of relationship or a sense of knowing. They were knowing each other. They were being together. They they came to know each other more and more. And as they came to know each other more and more and relate to each other, they loved each other more and more. Thus, their love was growing. It was a dynamic thing. This is a remarkable reality. And yet people today live such shallow lives and have such shallow relationships one of the challenges I believe in our church, and I would, I would just indicate this to us for, for prayerful concern, is that we continue to grow in our love for one another by growing in our relationship with each other. And I realize in every church, it's true in my church, there are circles of people. There are those who hardly ever come. We hope we see them Christmas. There are those who come and leave as quickly as possible. They really are uncomfortable in being here. They come and fellowship with their buds, but they don't want to know anybody else. And then there are those of you, you beautiful people, who hang around and fist bump my son. And share and talk and pray. We eat together. We pray together. We study together. We hurt together. We laugh together. Our love is growing and growing and growing because of our love for God and for each other. This is what Paul is talking about. If you really want to know the fullest expression of the love of God in your life experience on this earth, grow in your love for him and grow in your love for his people. The second virtue or uh, evidence is love. Thirdly, faith, love, third, perseverance. It's right there in verse 4. I'm not making it up. (laughs) Perseverance. Again, he says, I'm so... When I, when I pray, I think of these qualities in your life. I'm so proud of you. I, I am so excited what God is doing in, in your life. Verse 4, and when I talked to other churches, and Paul did. He went from church to church. He said, I, I brag on you. I boast on you. I said, man, those folks over there, God is really working among them. I see their faith. I see their love. Verse 4, I see their perseverance. <laughs> perseverance. Perseverance is, as I've already indicated today, A steadfastness and endurance, it's hanging in there when you feel like quitting. I want to say several things about that from a biblical perspective. First of all, and and this is an evidence, remember, an evidence of the operation of God's grace in your life. There is perseverance. The first thing I want to say about that is this perseverance is necessary. It's necessary. Perseverance in Christ, perseverance in the Christian life, perseverance in following the Lord is natural and necessary. It is part of the DNA God put in you when he saved you. It it, it was part of the software download. When he (laughs) changed your heart, he turned you into one who, who had faith in Christ and loved Christ and would stick with Christ. Perseverance. We live in a world of sin and hardship. And fallen dreams. Ladies and gentlemen. I know I'm not informing you of the fact. When I say life is messy. At times it's overwhelming. At times it's incredibly hard. At times we think we're not going to make it. At times we have no strength left. And we cast ourselves utterly and absolutely upon God. And his grace. At times we slip and fall. At times we drift. At times we sin. At times we wander off. But never in our life as Christ's disciples and God's people will we ever quit following Jesus Christ. In the midst of the messiness, at least four things will always continue. Faith in Christ, we believe in Him, we follow Him, we're committed to Him. Two, love for Christ, we love Him. We come to worship because we love Him. Third, we have hope in Christ. Our hope in this this fallen, degenerate world is in the promise that we have in the gospel of Jesus Christ. And four, we are loyal to Jesus Christ. Whether it's going into a, 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 a booth to vote, we're going to vote like a Christian or go to work. And sit at the desk and do our work. I'm a Christian. 
How can I be a Christian here? Perhaps it's school. How can I be a Christian here? Listen, Christians can persevere in these ways, and we must. This is the Christian's life. This is the will of God. And in every Christian, you will always find these four qualities. Faith in Christ, love for Christ, hope in Christ, and loyal commitment to Christ. That's the necessary presence of perseverance. What is the environment of perseverance? It is defined in two ways in our text. One, persecution. Two, affliction. These terms are related but not synonymous. Persecution is a specific term that relates to you and I being mistreated because we belong to Jesus. Because we live the Christian life. Jesus says the following in John 15. And I quote, If the world hates you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love its own. But because you are not of the world, I chose you out of the world for this the world hates you. Remember the word that I said to you, said Jesus. A slave is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will persecute you. If they kept my word, they will keep yours as well. All these things, he says, they will do to you for my name's sake because they do not know the one who sent me. It is true to say sometimes Christians do really dumb things. And they're afflicted for it. And, and if we do dumb things, that's our bad. That's not Jesus' bad. But here's the point Jesus is saying. If you are a faithful, loving, true follower of mine as a disciple, and, and you seek to honor God and love others, they are going to persecute you because you're doing that. You say, well, that doesn't make sense. I want to ask you a question. Did it make sense for them to persecute and kill Jesus? If they did that to him, they're going to do it to you. And they're going to do it to you for the same reason they did it to him. It hates Christians because it hates Christ. The world hates Christ. You think the world loves Christ? It doesn't love Christ. You think you just open the door, invite everybody to come, and they're just going to come in here? And by the way, churches that are trying desperately to get the community to like them and come are wretched places. They're not even churches. I hate to be so blunt about that. Oh, we're going to do this and this and this and get a big crowd. Listen, if you're true to the truth, they won't come because you're true to the truth. You preach the truth. You love the truth. They're of the world. They believe the world's ideologies. But Christians were chosen out of the world. We love Christ. We follow Christ's teachings. The world does not. Now, the other word is afflictions, persecutions and afflictions. Afflictions has to do not with people persecuting us, but when stuff doesn't work out right. It can and does refer to circumstances and situations that are turned against us. And there are times, I'm absolutely convinced, when nothing seems to go right. Our plans fall through, our dreams are crushed. Life does not seem to be on our side. It's when you come home from a trip and walk downstairs and step on the carpet and you're in a swamp. There's a term for that. Murphy's Law. Defined by the simple explanation, if anything can go wrong, it will. Science has actually studied Murphy's Law. One wrote the following about Murphy's Law. It, it's an affirmation that it exists. <laughs> and I, I quote, Murphy's Law is an experience common to all that find that on any special occasion, everything that can go wrong will go wrong. This may be an attribute of the malignity of matter or the total depravity of inanimate things. Remarkable language for a scientist to say. Or whether the exciting cause is hurry, worry, or whatnot, the fact of Murphy's Law remains. End of quote. There are just times, like Job, when everything just seemed to fall apart. This is in the word affliction. And Paul said about these Christians that they hung in there. 
They didn't quit. They didn't back down because life had turned against them. Let me tell you something about life. It's fallen in sin. It is in a dimension of degradation and inevitable decline. Sin is so pervasive and intrinsic to the very molecular structure of the material reality, including our humanity, that everything declines because of it. It seems to imply the reality of something that is akin to Murphy's Law. However, the Bible also says Christians are victorious in such occasions. It doesn't mean every day is a great day with Jesus. It doesn't mean we always win the victory. There are days when we cry, we hurt, we want to run off to some cave and hide. But Paul will say in Romans 8, we are more than conquerors in Christ. Jesus would say in John chapter 14, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. Verse 27 of the same chapter, peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. Not as the world gives, give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled. Neither let it be fearful. He was telling these disciples that they live in a fallen, pitiful, dangerous world filled with sickness, anger, hatred, and death. But in all of that, Jesus would be with them in the power of the Holy Spirit. His promises would brighten their darkest day. And he would meet them at the deepest point of their need. And through Christ and his promise, there would be ample life and grace and peace and hope for them. And for this reason... They could fight and they would fight against depression and despair. The scripture calls God's people to endure, be steadfast, to not give in. Endure it well. Endure it with faith, comfort, peace, and a sense of well-being. Trusting all things to God, to his kind and powerful and loving hands. Is this hard to do? Are you kidding It's absolutely the most difficult thing you could ever do. But you must do it. You must give yourselves to prayer and give your life and circumstance to Christ. Hebrews 11 says, Faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. Though thou slay me, I will trust. Praise thee even from the dust to prove And tell it as I prove thy glorious incomprehensible love. Thou mayest chasten and correct. But thou canst never neglect. Since the ransom price is paid. On thy love my hope is stayed. I simply will point out. That in verse 4 of our text. There is a connection between perseverance and faith. You cannot persevere without faith. If you have faith you will persevere. Thus faith itself is persevering. And it fuels all other persevering. Faith reminds us of God's nature and his promise in Christ. It points to our destiny, our future and glory. It assures us that God is with us. He is over all things. We can trust him. It preaches to our fearful hearts that we can win the peace. It reminds us that the battle for peace and joy is worth it because it points the way to God and gives him glory. A few balanced concepts for those of you who are going, yeah, right. Pastor doesn't know what I'm going through. I want to say a few things that I hope will clarify the issue. The Bible does not say life is easy. Or that fighting for joy is easy. Or that we won't be hurt or scared. Nor does the Bible say we won't have setbacks, failures. Or even at times be overcome by our weaknesses. But the Bible does say that God will never give up on us. His plan for our lives is as certain as if it's already done. The Bible does say that God never, thanks be to God, never gets so disgusted with us that he said, I've had it. And kicks us out and cancels us like this culture is canceling people today. God doesn't do that. He chastises, yes. He disciplines, yes. He cleanses, yes. Is that painful? (laughs) Yes. But he doesn't quit. The Bible says that because God is faithful to his promise to us in Christ. And our salvation in Christ is experienced step by step by the work of the Holy Spirit. We can fight against the darkness. We must, brothers and sisters, fight against the darkness. Faith, love, perseverance, application and conclusion. Three takeaway points. 
Three take-home ideas. Number one, I want you to always remember that we live in a fallen world. <laughs> Sickness, hardship, persecution are all part of the natural world in rebellion against God. When these things happen, we should not be surprised, angry, or become bitter at God. Number two, when hard things come, when they come, we are called to faith, to love, to perseverance. We are not called to revenge. We are not called to try to right every wrong we think there is and make it right from our own perspective. That's not our job. Our job is faith, love, perseverance. Three, what should we do then? We should concentrate more on the Lord. We should concentrate more on our walk with Jesus. Not on our circumstances. Not on the failures of others in our lives. Get your minds off of what they did. And get your mind on Jesus Christ. And you will have peace. Brothers and sisters in Christ, God is with you. He has given you the tools to fight well. May God grant us the grace to actualize these tools and live in the light of His beauty and holiness. Let us pray together. Heavenly Father, when we fail, when we slip, when we wander, when we drift, when we sin, when we mess up, I pray that you would turn the spotlight on your holiness and your promise to remind us of what sin truly is, but that your compassion and your redemption in Christ is just for such a moment as that. And bring us home. Bring us home. And equally, I would pray that when your children Brothers and sisters in Christ, when they encounter trials, challenges, obstacles, speed bumps, things that hinder and hurt, that you would turn us to you. And that in the trial, that time and that place and that experience would become a laboratory in which we come to know your love and your truth more clearly. Make it so, we pray. Thank you for this morning, for your word for your spirit's illumination. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.